What's going on, everybody? It's me, Mark, and welcome back to another, and all my episodes are very special, so welcome back to another very special episode of Blurredcast. I am joined by two growing legends in the podcasting industry. Why don't you guys go ahead and introduce Hi, everybody. Aloha. My name is Moana McAdams. I am the host of the Moana Nui podcast. Um, it's a BIPOC podcast that also celebrates geekdom, but more so from a cultural perspective and creating safe spaces for our communities. I'm also a children's book writer for the Adventures of Nakoa and Nohea uh, children's book series and a publisher for um, our company, Burning Spirit Comics, and our flagship comic the wild card chronicles thank you so much for having us on the show no problem no problem and what about you ryan for sure uh, my name is ryan robinson i'm a fine arts and illustrator um i am the illustrator for the adventures of nicoa nohia shadows of the ancient in the next book for journey to Aikua for book three um i'm also um an indie variant artist for numerous different comic publishers um, and a painter, an artist at heart, and a massive movie buff and geek as well. Hey, great. Thank you guys for coming on. Um, if you haven't seen my podcast or heard any of my podcasts before, I always like to start these off with a very fun topic or fun, interesting question. And that is, what have you guys been geeking out to recently? Uh, Moana, I see you are going to be on a Disney Plus panel tomorrow uh, talking about She-Hulk. So I'm assuming you're all familiar with She-Hulk and you caught up and seen the finale. Oh my gosh. No, I'm actually running behind on She-Hulk. Um, and so fortunately, I'm not the one moderating the panel because it would probably be a disaster <laughs> if I had to do it. Um, but I, I did see the first couple episodes of the series and I actually like it. I know there was a lot of um, controversy, especially about the Megan Thee Stallion episode, but I, I, I just think it's overblown. Like, just enjoy the character. It's pretty dope. Agreed. We get to see the Hulk too. Like, Let's just have a cool story and, you know, and see what it is. She's a woman of power. She's a, you know, a lawyer making some moves. Like, can a woman just live? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I agree. I definitely agree. Uh, uh, what about you, Ryan? What have you been geeking out to? Um, I've been really liking House of the Dragons. Um, Rings of Power just been okay. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen She-Hawk. I've been watching, uh, lately right now, I've been watching The Midnight Club and Interview with the Vampire. Um, that's Ooh. been my, my go-to shows right now. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much what I've been doing. Yep. Okay. Uh, what? And this is for both of you guys. What has been the one uh, content or the one show or game or whatever that you've consumed so far this year that's been um, a complete surprise to you? Something that you weren't expecting to, to consume? This, this requires me actually remembering this year. I feel like so much of it is a blur, but... Um, it has been a pretty awesome year. 2022 has definitely been a good year for content. Oh, well, it wasn't a show or whatever, but the movie The Woman King, like... Yes, I heard really good things about I, that. Yes, it was like, for me... Like, if you enjoyed Black Panther, this was kind of like delving into the culture and the... Um, of the Dormelage, which you know is female warriors i'm all about it i i like seeing properties where they celebrate the feminine and kind of present them in a way where it's not them being reliant on a male savior not to say that males are not needed but like giving women a space to express themselves and show their own power um in different ways and finding ways to inspire uh younger girls in that way because a lot of the media especially comics um and in a lot of geek culture it's male dominated um protagonists right so anytime i can see um a project that's flipping it on the other side and giving women a voice and, and, a, and a place in it i really appreciate those projects Okay, cool. Uh, what about you, Ryan? What's something that uh, has stood out to you the most so far this year as far as geek culture and content? Um, I've really, I enjoyed The Woman King as well. Um, it was a pretty spectacular film and it was very positive for once seeing, you know, culture and that. But for me, I think I've really enjoyed House of Dragons. <laughs> it brought me right back to the world of Game of Thrones. 
Um, but the thing that stands out the most for me, um, I really, I'm really enjoying the interview with the vampire because I'm a big Anne Rice fan. So, and I like the new spin, the modernization of it, but also the the core values is staying at Anne's literature as well. So it's been a real surprise for me. Really, really surprised. That's great. That's great. Um, one thing that I've noticed, and I kind of maybe I didn't ask my question the right way, but one thing that I've noticed uh, just this year alone is the uh, increase in the uptrend in diversity and representation mm -hmm. across the board in geek culture from cons to cosplay to media and movies like, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, the House of Valerian. Uh, Mm -hmm. people in game of thrones like they're all black people with with blonde yes. golden uh silver dreads and that's awesome um uh the woman king was really good nope came out this year and you know that i'm a big uh fan of all his work and his movies with us and get out yes. um uh, yeah. which i haven't seen yet so like and then like <laughs> other things like other cultures are coming into the mix uh with you know we have cultures Neither. coming together and yes i was about to bring that up in black panther 2 wakanda forever uh yeah. we're having a culture clash of different Different cultures yes. that I love to see together, um, and then everything, uh, everywhere, all at once was a great movie and great mm -hmm. representation for the Asian community. So I love mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. the uptrend in just representation across geek culture across the board, especially on the con level. Like I went to MomoCon this year, and MomoCon was a black anime geek con everything <laughs> together like all awesome. the black cosplayers coming out all the women of color cosplaying um and just being themselves it was so amazing so i had so much fun there but since we're on the subject of culture and diversity uh moana why don't you give me a little bit more about your background and your ancestry uh because you come from probably the coolest place in in the country <laughs> Yes, I was born and raised in the islands of Hawaii. Um, oh man, growing up there is, it's really hard to explain like how special Hawaii is and people talk about the spirit of aloha, but I think it's hard to explain until you can come there and experience it. Um, but I know not everybody can do that, right? Because traveling to Hawaii, it takes forever. It's a 10 hour plane ride. Like if you live on the East Coast where I'm at, and it's also, you know, it's not a cheap ticket, right? So like my big thing about creating the adventures of Nakoa and Ohea series is trying to capture the essence of what Hawaii is, the, the beauty of the people, the beauty of the culture, um, the beauty of our stories into a book and a series that people can enjoy and um it's you know it's really for all ages but like i take a lot of the the spirit of what's in the book and in the characters and i infuse it with people from my family um friends that i grew up with experiences that i had even some of my ancestors who are no longer with us like my father was the one who um inspired me to write my first book fishing day with papa ray was essentially a love letter to him and some of my like the life lessons that he taught me kind of that were most powerful and you know the ones that really st stuck with me throughout my life and a lot of it is very what people today would probably consider simplistic but to me it's those simple lessons and remembering those things that kind of helps you feel grounded um in your culture in your identity in your own power and like realizing that um you know your your identity and your your voice and all of that stuff matters especially in a world where it's easy for us to get drowned out because we just get inundated with so much stuff and a lot of it is great but by the same token a lot of it is not so great right so hawaii is just Oh man, it's a paradise, but it's also, there's a lot of struggle there that happens from the locals who live there. There's what you see in a lot of indigenous cultures, a lot of shared um, challenges in terms of land resources, land, you know, fights for land and, you know, um, being overtaken by colonization and some of the effects that come with it, you know, like it is a number one, or if not number one, one of the top tourist spots, but the, the beauty that attracts people there requires, you know, like uh, when we talk about sustainability and climate change and all those things, those are all key aspects that are like a huge part of Hawaiian culture. And in order to preserve that, like it just takes a lot. And it's our tourism has been 
way too much like it's it's inundating the islands um and we have a lot of um i'm not sure if folks are tracking like the recently i think the last year or so there was a oil spill that coming out of the navy yard um on the island of Oahu and that's um, kind of essentially polluting a lot of the island's water sources and that's been a huge deal causing a lot of health issues. Um, and so water is really central to our culture, um, not just from an ocean perspective, but just from sustainability. Um, and so I, I incorporate a lot of those themes um, into the book as well. We have what we call our mo'o and they're essentially water protectors. And they're also seen as like what we would consider an almakua or a family guardian, uh, people who have kind of passed on, but then take on other forms to guide and protect you from, you know, kind of beyond. Um, and so we play with that concept in this, um, in sh starting with Shadows of the Ancient, which was the first book that Ryan illustrated, uh, and now with Journey to Ikua in our third book. And again, that allows me to play with the concept of, you know, our female warriors and if you, you know, in my study and my research, not just in Hawaiian culture, but in other indigenous cultures and in my travels around the world, the one um, thing that I definitely stands out to me is that women have always played a central role in the leadership of, you know, and the indigenous people. And so that's something that I want to bring to the forefront um, through my books, uh, because even looking back at Hawaiian history, there's a lot of focus only on the males, but there were definitely females who are really um, pivotal to our, our our history and our culture. That's that's amazing. Uh, you gave me so much to digest. <laughs> I, I really like while you was talking, I'm, lo I'm looking at your Kickstarter and I'm like, oh, my God, the artwork is amazing. And I just can't wait to dive into like more of the nuances of creating uh, an illustration children's book like that and like the knowledge and just the culture that you're bringing to the forefront uh it's amazing because i i grew up in georgia all my life and like one of the first things i learned about uh our country uh outside of many other things was like just how beautiful hawaii is and just like how unique and culturally different from the united states uh that that it is and i'm just so fascinated to dig in to learn more uh but before we go in and talk a little bit more about your book i would like to get ryan's backstory yes. and hear more about him and how he got into art oh um with me art has been in my blood so um art i've been drawing and painting um for a long time now uh, i've been drawing since i was two so oh wow okay yeah, okay art has been literally part of me um and has been <laughs> with me um i really started to take art really serious around middle school and starting to adapt my craft a little bit more learning how to do portraits and getting really extensive in portraits and then i started painting so i've been painting for over like 20 to 20 i think forever now i, I, don't, I don't even think it's 20 years anymore i think it's part of me um, but I went to uh, the Art Institute of Pittsburgh where I first started at, um, and then I didn't finish there. I finished at the Columbus College of Art and Design and graduated in 2007 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts um, with a focus area of fine art and illustration because um, I'm a painter at heart. So where I paint is watercolor and oil. That's my forte. But then I started, I took a break because I got sick. Um, I got sick when I was 18 and it's been ongoing. And then I got really sick in 2007, 2008, and was sick for a long time. So I didn't pick up art until about 2012, 2013 again. So I took a break. And then uh, the digital platform came on crew and on site. Started messing around with digital art and really get into that focus because, you know, Ryan likes to save money. <laughs> so because art supplies <laughs> and stuff cost a lot of money. And if I can yeah. paint, and it has the same focus and the same everything i'm going to utilize this new tool um so i started taking digital art pretty serious in 2016 and just been working on it and honing in my specific style of how i want my work to look and i found what i liked and it's been with me ever since um and i met moana through michael um through uh, fsk freestyle comics um and then we started talking about pushing her series forward um and then we started really 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 talking <laughs> and then uh we decided to say hey let's go ahead and do this 
So we started working on uh, Shadows of the Ancient. Um, very slowly, we were just dropping nuggets here and there, but then it was just, you know, really serious when we started uh, putting out the artwork, talking about the Kickstarter, and then it just came to fruition um, at that point in time. Um, and then we added this story of fun and elements, but underneath it all, it takes a turn in the middle where you start to see a change in focus of where Moana wants to take her characters at and lead them to into the next book. So the book ends off in a lovely cliffhanger um, with Moana as our, our water protectors, our water gods. And, you know, in the next book, it shows the shape of where we're going to head. And there's going to be a lot of changes in the next book as well, just like in this book. Um, and it's been nothing but an incredible experience um, and getting to create new worlds and build worlds. And this new book is primarily majority of my style because we had our first illustrator in the first book. And I wanted to keep kind of that same perspective of the first illustrator, but with my colors and with everything in regards to that. But now it's just, you know, another jump off point where I can really push where I would like to, where you can see the change. Um, and that's the focus of what I'm going to be doing with this book. And we have a lot of new things and it's just been a really beautiful creative journey. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, it I can tell the passion that went behind this project just by hearing you talk about the art creation process and just working with <clears throat> Moana and creating her stories. So, like, I, I this is going to be an amazing uh, podcast interview. Uh, again, just thank you both for coming on. Um, I do have a follow up question for you, uh, Ryan, before we get into the nitty gritty of things. Uh, you mentioned something that I personally am kind of struggling with myself as I'm transitioning from a traditional media uh, mm -hmm. into more digital media. In your artistic prof uh, professional uh, opinion, digital art versus traditional media is like painting and drawing and things like that. Which do you prefer? I And you made that joke about digital uh, media. For me, this, this is the thing where people forget. I think people for, think like digital art is like, oh, you're just, you know, still in photos, manipulating them and then painting over top of them. That's what most people think. And this is why digital art has like such a, a scratch and a bad name because that's how people think. Just the same way how, you know, we got animation. It was the same idea or any new tool or computer graphics. Like it was going to kill the, the movie industry if we don't work in practical. Like it's the same idea. To me, it's just another tool. When I'm doing digital art, I'm doing the same thing I would do if I was using a canvas, gesso and brushes. It's the same thing. When I apply paint down on my flat can, it's the same thing. Like there is no difference in regards to digital art. They're just called layers now. That's the only difference. <laughs> you know, they're called layers. You have one application and then you have another application and you have a, you like, you'll have one for your line work and then you'll have one for your first paint wash down and you'll have another one for your second. And then you just build on top of it you know digital art for me is one of the best things that has come out in a long time it is literally a game changer mm -hmm. you know i don't have three to four hundred dollars to go out and buy new brushes new paint new canvases and all that stuff but if i have brushes that are the same conceptual design and can apply the same way then i'm painting it's the same thing you know so there's no difference. I do everything the same if I was doing anything else in my art. I will draw it and then I will paint it, you know? So I, I don't like that digital art has a bad rap um, because there's no difference when I'm doing my work, you know? Right, and tell you can them follow how many my work. you have. Yeah, you can follow <laughs> my work. I have many time lapses and they're too long. <laughs> Okay, they're too long. <laughs> you know, so I really have to cut them just to make it work because they're too long. <laughs> Ryan hey. has all the layers. <laughs> all the layers. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with having too much content. Like, we live in such a content consuming heavy uh, mm -hmm. uh, timeline now. So, like, you can never have too much coverage or BTS of your work and things. You 
all, you'll have enough content to come out for a while. Um, Moana, I want to shift gears back to you for a second before we move on to the next subject. You said something interesting about your ancestry. I wanted to ask you, uh, is it difficult for you to uh, blend your ancestry? Because you come from different backgrounds uh, with the Hawaiian Polynesian ancestry, your American ancestry. Uh, do you find it difficult blending cultures and trying to find a story there to tell? Uh, or is it uh, more of an enjoyable process for you that you can take the best and the worst of your upbringing and the stories that you want to tell and bring them forward to the front light? You know, that's a that's a great question because um, it's something that is always at the forefront on my mind, right? Like, you know, when you're telling a story, one of the main questions you have to ask is who is your target audience? Right. Um, and I think it just, it really depends because in my heart, like if I could do this and it doesn't matter who's going to look at this story, my, my target audience is the five or six year old Hawaiian child mixed race little child who's back on the islands and you know is having a lot of fun but like they don't have a lot of role models you know like when i was a kid there wasn't a lot of um and there still isn't a ton of them there's more but when i watch movies and when i watch tv shows i don't see a lot of people i don't see myself reflected in those characters right so my one of my main goals is to one, show the characters in my stories. And then even more importantly, two, know that there's somebody who came out of that community who is telling the story, who is publishing the story, who is, you know, like bringing that unique and authentic perspective into it. Because then that helps the child to see like, oh, my auntie, you know, we call everybody, it's a respect auntie and uncle. You would think like we have huge families, which we do, but it's a term of endearment and a term of respect that we use. Um, you know, oh, Auntie Moana is doing this. Maybe I can write a story too, right? Oh, so I could write my own story, you know? Um, and so that's like my passion audience, right? But by the same token, even though I am writing for my culture and my community, there are so many parallels because there's very a lot of other communities who are also underrepresented and not have enough presence in media so like i but for them i just want them to enjoy a, like an adventure a story i want them to feel like the way i felt when i saw moana and i was like man not just because it's my name but because it's my culture on a big screen to told beautifully with visual you know Lots of visual, um, stunning visual effects. Like that's why I love Ryan's art so much. And like, it just, like earlier today, I had, you know, I posted my story in a group and this lady, she's definitely like my mother's generation, I would say. And I don't know her, she's a perfect stranger. I know she's in the Hawaiian community, but she said, I love you for this, you know, this book. I love it. Where can I buy one? Like I cried and I don't even know why. Like that's like, if I can evoke that in someone, like to me, that's the huge win. And if there are other people who can appreciate my story, just like we had like so much success with the Moana movie, like for me, I I, I just love that. Like, even if it's the, pop the, the widespread popularity is great because that's what helps you elevate and get more resources to your project. But for me, the really meaningful stuff is walking into a classroom and having like seeing the faces of the kids, like, wow, you know, like, you wrote this? Like, how did you make this? You know, and, and, and having them like see, ask those questions and explore those possibility and the potential that they could also do too. To me, that that's the big win. Wow, that that's actually so powerful that you said that. Um, and that's why representation matters and why different cultures are pushing to be represented more and more accurately. So just thank you for that. Cause like, uh, it, it, for me growing up, I grew up in the nineties myself and you know, there was, there was representation, but it was just generic representation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I grew up watching Power Rangers. So every season Power Rangers has the one black character and that's yes. who all black people have to relate to. And now in later seasons, they're being more, really more diverse because like, I don't know how to say this in a PC way, but like you'll watch something and they have diverse characters of white characters and things like that. But we have generic black character, generic Asian character. And now 
these media companies are realizing, hey, there's just as much diversity within the black culture, the Latinx culture and yep. the Asian communities uh, that there is in white communities. So let's bring in different body types and different people from different backgrounds and things like that. And just uh, again, I cannot say how much I just love the Polynesian Hawaiian culture and like just the the Pacific Islands all together. So I'm just so happy like that you are at the forefront of bringing those stories and bringing representation to that community. So just thank you so much for everything that you have done. Um, I will also have a little segue. This is a random question that just came up because of what you just said um, with the story you shared. There's been the trend on TikTok, uh, a say controversy because of certain things certain companies have been doing to be more inclusive. Uh, let's talk about The Little Mermaid for a hot second. Um, wh what are your thoughts and opinions on uh, the Little Mermaid Ariel being portrayed by Holly Berry. And uh, what does that mean um, moving forward? Like, will we see more, I don't wanna say race swapping of like fictional characters, but like, are we going to see more of that in the future? And is it going to be even more controversial moving forward? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I haven't been following it as closely, but I think, I mean, I think it's good from, like you know like seeing seeing yourself in a character so i think that's good um but like that in itself to me is not enough because if you if the storyline is still going to be the same then you know what are you really what new value are you adding into it other than swapping a face right like i don't know uh ryan you have any thoughts yeah, like, I, I agree. It's like a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it's great for inclusion and diversity and see a woman of color being a lead and be a Disney princess mm -hmm. and represent for little girls everywhere, every little Black girl out there, or any uh, girl of color. Um, but like I said, if there is no intentions of giving anything additional to this story, it doesn't work, you know? It doesn't do anything for, you know, to push anything forward. Like Moana said, it's not enough. Now, if they're doing something with story to have more, you know, reasoning behind everything, because in the original 80s film, it's just another story of a girl needing help from a man and like, <laughs> like, and like it's just, it's, it's the same cliche. And if it's going to fall suit down that rabbit hole again, it's going to be, for me, a loss because they could yeah. take advantage of, you know, giving the story a more powerful representation. You know, we only have very few black stories that out there that give you that kind of representation. So, like, I really hope Disney changes things with this live action because most of their live action things have been to me pretty unsuccessful they have not been done really well at all um, oh, i agree i definitely agree to that <laughs> so like it's just to me it's like you know if you want to make another cash grab you know you could have easily cast somebody different like she didn't need to be in it like but for me if they're going to do something special with this in which i hope they do right. then good but like i said i have not been a, a fan of any of these live action films at all yeah, and I think too, like when I kind of look at these things, I'm a person who looks like in depth. And maybe it's because like I'm an adult now, and so looking at, you know, one of the one of my favorite movies, essentially when I was a kid, but looking at it with like adult eyes, you know, I I, I go to the thing where I'm like, okay, what is the message that we're sending to young girls though? That like you know like ryan said like they need the man to be free right like to be free of her watery existence to go you know be on land and whatever it is but for her to be legit like that has to be you know the message and how are we limiting you know like i see the kind of like long-term results of that you, you know um we see a lot of women who don't feel like they have worth without like because they're single or because of you know whatever xyz but to me that's like that's just a surface thing right like i it frustrates me when i see women who who feel like they have to oh, what's the word meet that mold or whatever um right. in order to feel like you know they're fulfilled and, and you know and and they're confident and you know have self-confidence and 
I don't know, just feel like they're 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 valued. Yeah, I, I I just that's my concern, just in general for women because I'm all about like the empowerment aspects and just helping, you know, young ladies see that yes, that is one great. It's a great thing. I have a husband, so I'm the, <laughs> you know I'm like I'm not I'm not saying that oh you're a man hater or anything like that. But like my husband also appreciates that like I have my own identity and it's really important for the two of us to have like we're better together. But if we had to be alone, like we'd be fine too, right? Like so kind of establishing that, I don't know, independent nature, not in the way where I'm excluding people, but that like if push comes to shove, I'll still be fine. Gotcha. Um, I 100% agree with the both of you. I do think... Uh, on the one hand and on the surface level yes it is great that disney they are trying to be more representative and be more sensitive to other cultures because i again i grew up in the 80s 90s uh up until tiana princess tiana which we'll talk about that in a hot second um all disney princesses were white uh and every single one of them needed a man to get out of whatever problems or situation that they were in and even growing up i felt like that was weird on so many levels like one why do women all women need a man to for anything i grew up with uh, uh you know my mother mm -hmm. a single mother a single parent household and you know she did everything uh, i mean not saying that my mother didn't have help but she didn't need anybody to help we were great we were great and we survived and got through and she raised two beautiful adults after that um but just seeing like what disney is doing like i agree with you a lot ryan like the live action remakes of their disney princesses stories are not working and uh, they're trying these oh. i feel like gimmicks to kind of get them to be more meaningful like i remember when they did the remake of beauty and the beast and they made gaston a random side character they made him gay and it and that caused a bunch of controversy and things like that and i do feel like with this little mermaid um you know no shade towards holly berry she's an amazing singer she's a very beautiful and uh an intelligent woman mm -hmm. uh but i do feel like it's kind of gimmicky coming from disney because like you said moana if nothing else in the story has changed and all you did was just change the color of her skin you're not adding any additional value to the story um and this brings me to uh tiana uh we did get a black disney princess in the early 2000s um the, uh, the princess and the frog and my issue with that was she was a frog the entire movie right. we never oh. got to see her blackness except at the beginning and at the it's end the same and thing it's with the same soul. thing with soul yeah like you don't you don't see representation we maybe got in soul probably the same amount of time we got with tiana and <laughs> right you know, as being a black character, we got that barbershop scene, right? And him playing mm -hmm. at the jazz club, and he was a blue glob until the end, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's so weird you said that because actually, like, I like Soul, it's a good movie, but I that's a great Soul. poem, yeah, made me cry, <laughs> yeah, I love Soul. But, but yeah, yeah, I I feel like that what Disney is doing is really just a cash grab. They saw what they did with Black Panther and the MCU and how mm -hmm. like that brought in so much money. So they're just thinking, let's just do this. And we're just going to all of these properties and uh, things are just going to bring in buco money. Now that they're the media giant that they are, they can kind of do things like that. But if they're not adding the substance behind it and showing the real representation or real problems and struggles, it's just comes off as a gimmick i'm sorry yeah mm -hmm. and i think i think that's the danger of having you know big media giants like disney in in that when you get to be that size you're it's, it's all about the bottom line now and you lose right. the magic of what it means to be a creative and to and to put a new perspective into a story which is why i love being a part of the indie community yes you need the best of both worlds right like as indies to be to survive we kind of got to get you know we have to have that room to level up and, and get to you know those bigger um resource pools and, and stuff like that but like along the way you know the more you you get pulled into those things the water the more watered down your creativity gets um and so that's why you know that's why i, I appreciate the kickstarter platform because it kind of helps you fund you know like your creative vision your passion projects and help to get out into the world in a way that you couldn't get to through traditional publishing and traditional methods just because they're inundated with so many different things 
and if you don't have you know somebody to pull your name out of the hat right you pull your project up you're, you're just chances of you getting pulled to even be considered for a publishing deal or you know a movie deal or whatever it is it's like this right it's all about who you know um and that kind of thing so yeah i i just feel like there's when you get that big there's a, a lack of creativity i agree i 100 percent agree yeah you take what works and then you want to like duplicate it but then it's like you, you still have to be unique like there still has to be a perspective that's what art is you know? right so. and it, it, i think at a certain price point like you said when you get so big you know it's all about your bottom line right. uh you know even with the mcu the first two phases were so you know their thing and now we get phase four and you can instantly tell phase four is not like the rest and that they're just trying to fit everything in the mold it's going to to make money and they're going to move on to the next thing when they're not even finished with the current thing that they're working on uh and you lose a lot of creativity and a lot of uniqueness in that type of process uh and this is a great segue to talk about your kickstarter but yes the indie uh community uh it is indie and it is a struggle sometimes but you need the indie community to get new fresh ideas out there new takes new stories and things like that so i definitely wish and hope a lot more people which in the last couple of years a lot of people have been looking more towards the indie community for new uh talent new creations and new ips and projects um but since we are talking about kickstarter let's segue into your kickstarter and your new book that's out now that you are uh here to promote and i am sitting here and i'm just going over the artwork and i'm just like like the artwork is amazing uh i'm gonna just give a round of applause like i'm looking at this and i'm like oh my god like this is this is beautiful so moana why don't you go ahead and tell us about your kickstarter and the new book yeah sure so the name of the third book uh in the series is journey to ikua um it is a 32 page premium hardcover so you know kids are rough on their books you gotta make some good quality stuff in addition to the story, we have like what I like to do in our books is to push the ed educational aspect in it, too. So like on the backside, oh, it is bilingual. So it's in English and Hawaiian language, um, which is important to me again, uh, because that put a, a smile on my face. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but that put a smile on my face. <laughs> yes, there was a time not so long ago that like speaking our language was banned. Um, in that's right. I remember. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, I remember ahead. hearing um that the Hawaiian indigenous language was dying out, and that there's yep. a new a revival to bring it back to the forefront and things like that. Uh, and I. I, I'm a I'm a lingual file a little bit. I'm a huge nerd on so many different levels, and yes. like learning different languages is one of my favorite things. And the heart like people say Chinese and Japanese are like the hardest languages to learn. No, you try going and learning a Native American language like Cherokee, or uh, uh, or learning a Polynesian language like Hawaiian, <laughs> and I'm just like, wait, you have so many characters in your alphabet, and you express so much and i cannot pronounce all these vowels put together for nothing um so i just <laughs> love it that you just said that it's going to be in hawaiian too so i'm going to definitely try to get a copy in english and hawaiian uh and i got a baby nephew he's gonna love this he's oh love i it. love it yes but Shout but i didn't mean to nephews. interrupt you <laughs> but i didn't mean to interrupt you it's just like when you said that that was like oh man that you playing with my heartstrings right now <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it that that's what i'm here for yeah, so it is in English and Hawaiian. It's bilingual. So on the back side, we also put in a pronunciation guide to help folks learn some of the words that you see in the story. All throughout the campaign, if you're following my Instagram or me on Facebook, I'm also doing a word of the day um, to help people learn, you know, new words in Hawaiian language and the meanings. And a lot of them are related into the story. Um, this time around, I can't remember which tier level but i'm also putting in an audio pronunciation guide and that's me um sounding out the words and helping you to kind of you know it's a lot of vowels hawaiian has a lot of vowels and it's not that hard once you get the general pronunciation of the vowel so in english it would be a e i o u in hawaiian it's a a e o u so it's more like in it comes from your chest instead ah, <laughs> okay that actually helps out so much right now <laughs> Yes. Um, so we have digital books. So um, all of our children's book series, you can get a digital bundle. We also have our comic book, The Wildcard Chronicles. And so you can choose from the bundles that we put together for you 
or you can get the $1 tier and then just pick the ones that you want from our add-on bonuses. But we have digital books, physical books, all of the physical books from this campaign are going to be signed by me at a minimum. And if we're lucky, like we did with Shadows of the Ancient, all of our backers got the books signed by both Ryan and me, which I thought was really fun because it's hard to get like the signatures of all the creators on the book. So I'm really excited that we got to do that. And there's also like special experience tracks where you can get commissions from Ryan or commissions from Mike Watson, who's one of our partners over at Freestyle Comics. Uh, you can get a spotlight on our um, on the Moana Nui podcast, which our Kickstarters is the only time that we can open up slots now, just because like Dana and I are booked like months ahead. And then we also have really cool ones where you get to name one of our villains or one of our henchmen. Um, and you'll get like really cool custom art like, to go with that for your henchmen, as well as like um, special get, uh, special ba uh, credit in inside the book when, when we print it. Um, and then the biggest tier we have is that you can become one of the warriors. Uh, it doesn't matter like male, female, they like we welcome all and you can have a warrior with your likeness and you get to name them too. So these warriors are going to play a huge role throughout the books. We'll see them in different um, capacities. And in the next book, book four, you're going to see them like a lot. So yeah, there's just so much in it. I don't know, Ryan, like what, what, what else should we say about the campaign? Like what excites you about it? I, I get, you know, I'm all, I, mean, I think so. for me, <laughs> the most exciting part about it is I know what happens in this book. So <laughs> yes. I think that's the thing that really, cause like I said, I keep saying this, this has been like my foreshadow for everything. If you like Terminator, this is like T2, like Judgment Day. <laughs> like, like this book is literally a roller coaster of fun, uh, changes, and emotional weight. Um, these characters have weight. Moana's putting weight to the characters. You'll pick up on their personality traits immediately. You'll know who they are immediately. She's uh, She did a really good job, and too, in regards to that. But in this one, it just feels different. I don't know. I just feel like it's another, like, garnish to the already delicious platter, you know? Another layer. That another we're... layer of beauty to it. And not to mention, we're going places. Like, yes. primarily on book two, we were just in one part of the island. Um, in this, we're going to be going to different places, you know? And this is the journey. You'll get to meet new characters in this one. Um, and a foreshadowing of what our great villain is doing. Also, you'll meet a new character that changes all of our individual four children in this book going forward. And by the end of the book, we will have a revelation in regards to what is the next book's going to be about and where it's going to go forward in this lovely, lovely little IP and universe that Moana is building. Um, we, I've had a great time. It's been nothing but short of a fun, beautiful experience. And the art will show and reflect that. Um, I'm going to be taking this art um, to a whole another level. It's going to be a little bit more in depth. There'll be a lot of details that you guys will need to focus on and catch in the book. Um, we'll have worlds, we'll have temples, we'll have caves, we'll have delicious amount of water. Um, <laughs> we'll have characters that are just going to be remem remembered. Um, and also, you know, I feel like when the kids, the, the kids have a lot of personality, we're gonna see a lot of changes with the kids. So it's just gonna be a really, really, just unreal experience this is not your typical children's book nope. you know it is something that's garnishing something on another level when it comes to doing children fantasy books and honing in on children because we're still teaching lessons mm -hmm. but there's subplots there's motives there's stakes in this book so that i think that's what's really different with moana's children books you know, in book two, we kept it clean and fun in like the first half of the book, but it then it took a whopping left turn. And now we're just on the left turn. I keep saying that. 
<laughs> um, and the left turn is nothing but greatness at this point in time. Yes. I'm. I, I just want to say, because like I said, I'm as you guys are telling me this, I'm on your page looking at Kickstarter and I am looking at just the artwork and I am completely floored <laughs> and blown away and inspired and moved by like every uh, like the concept art alone. Just everything looks like a beautiful painting. So, Ryan, great job there. Um, thank, thank you, sir. Um, like I'm, I, I like it's like such a beautiful blend. Like I can tell like the colors that like everything that you put into it how the motion how you design the characters everything has a flow to it mm -hmm. definitely pick up on the water concept uh and, and just in the art form because everything just flows together i again i'm an artist i went to art institute of atlanta so i'm also a, nice. an artist too, uh and i also used to dabble in painting uh that we'll probably say that for another podcast but uh <laughs> i i'm just like yes i'm just like so like just inspired like myself and just the artwork is beautiful and it's like a, a beautiful blend of polynesian heritage and like mm -hmm. I, it, like i can even see like african inspired like art, yes. artistic designs in this and this is like so beautiful and amazing the colors are vibrant um like i'm a visual person so this already has sold me on the book alone uh, <laughs> and, and this story the that's what the book's going to be about it's like when i say culture it will be infused with culture all our characters have infused culture in the wardrobe uh with hawaiian culture hawaiian culture is going to be littered in this book so like it's just it's next level stuff like i i, I feel like for me like book two was like a culture experience still beautiful still wonderful but right now i feel like when people pick up this book from two to three it's going to be like i'm i'm ready let's keep going let's go kind of thing you know, and the art is different. You know, I want to focus more of like, you know, having an extensive amount of feeling to the pages. Every time you turn the page, I want you to feel something new, you know? So that's the goal. Everything you see on the Kickstarter right now, that's what the book is going to look like. Um, and that that's how it's going to look. Like, it's there's nothing that you're not going to see anything different. It's just going to be a little bit more extensive a little bit more it has a lot more weight to it mm -hmm. and it's going to be texture to it you're going to feel like you're in these worlds that's the goal yeah because we wanted the environment to be just as much of a character as yeah you know as alive character. as all the other i i definitely get that i definitely get that because you have like you have a character that you have like a a, a, a beautiful landscape uh mm -hmm. based off of the design of that character that i'm looking at and i'm like uh this is going to be amazing like i cannot wait to get into this um so this i want to talk about a lot of the the creation process of a children's book i've um i've had other uh comic book creators writers artists designers come on my podcast and one of the big questions that we always get into and it, this is part of the first time i've had both an artist and a writer to answer this at the same time so i'm interested in here uh your your unique answers to this question but which is more important when creating an illustration or a comic is it the story or is it the artistic vision that brings the story to life which uh has more priority or is it something that you feel like they both have equal parts i mean with me and moana i mean like it's a match made in heaven it's kind of <laughs> weird to say because i don't know how other people work um but with me and moana it's a very collaborative experience um mm -hmm. We, we, we had, when we went, I went to Washington, we, we met together and we did an outline of book three. So it was kind of already like done for book three, but Moana is putting in the weight. And when, and like, when she started putting in the weight, that's when I started like designing the new iteration of how I want this book to look. You know, we're not changing things extensively. Mm -hmm. But I'm changing the characters into my style predominantly to give them a little bit more of animation flair to it, to have like they're moving. Mm -hmm. Like you feel like you're like turning a page, you want to feel like they're moving. They're going to have a lot more personality, a lot more facial expressions, a lot mm -hmm. more intuition in this book. Because this book deals with uh, fate, bravery, loyalty, and change. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of a lot of weight to these characters and we have to have them represented 
with these kind of words, you know? And that's where Moana comes in and builds these layers of extensive backstory, but in such a minimal way. It's like the quickest way of building a world in three sections, but it's minimal. But you know how massive and how much weight the book has. And then I take her images and create them and make them into what I feel like is best for the book. And it mm -hmm. just meshes really well. Like with book two, it felt right. It was like a match made in heaven. But like with book three, it's just like we are rolling like a steam engine on a train right now. And it's just <laughs> kicking up the pace. And like, it's just like, it just gets exciting every time we talk about yeah. what are the kids are going to do next? What's going to happen now? What's in like, I'm really excited because there's a special character in here that I just fell in love designing. And like, it's just something that no one expects. Like they're not going to expect it. And that's what I love most about creating an IP that has no affiliation with anything else. You know, and creating how I visually want these people to look, these creatures to look, and these worlds to look, but you know it's Hawaii. Mm -hmm. It still will be Hawaii. And that's what I think is really grounded in like in this world. But it's just like my own little Goonies, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that's right. Kind of like thing that I get to do and create these creatures and like these creatures are so unexpected. Like mm -hmm. you, you're not going to expect it. And I think that's what's so fun about it, you know? Hmm. Yeah. I would definitely say that uh, the way Ryan and I create is very non-traditional. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm delivering a script to him here, Ryan, this is what we're going to do. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. like we, we kind of, like Ryan said, we do our outline, you know, like we kind of talk about the wave tops of what we want to cover. But then like, I don't know, I just, I put more detail into it. Like Ryan pushes me because I, I know that like his art is essentially unlimited. So when the way I look at it is, okay, I can't write a blah story because it's not going to excite him. And if it doesn't excite him, it's not going to excite our readers because the art's going to be not what it should be right so like when we had like the first iteration of kind of like what this story was gonna be ryan was like it's good but like we gotta put steaks we gotta put more mm -hmm. meat on the bones and i'm like okay okay how am i gonna do this because the other thing too is like i never intended for this to be a series when i wrote the first book right so like my dad's in it and so Ooh. like between fishing day with papa ray and shadows of the ancient i was like okay how am i am i gonna bring like am i gonna bring my dad along or is he just gonna live within the first book and that be it but then i was like but i don't want that to happen because kind of writing this story also helps me keep my dad alive for my family too right so like what like what stories would i like would he be wanting us to tell and like me sitting there, you know, as a kid, right? Like, oh, like it's such a huge part of our culture is sitting in a garage and storytelling and just laughing and, you know, and all of that stuff. So how do I put this into the book? So like with Shadows, I was still kind of like trying to figure out like, I don't know, I felt like it was like an intermediary step. Like, okay, we're gonna go a little bit further, you know, we'll talk about some culture stuff, you know, and I put all that stuff in there. But now it's, I feel like we're really breathing more life into the story and making it bigger, which is like, if you're going to claim to be a fantasy book, you have to make the world big. Like it has to be mm -hmm. magical and like just incorporate so many different types of elements. But the reason why I, I feel like we can make this unique story is because I'm writing, not just inventing something. I'm taking things that I know about that I lived, people around me, experiences that are real, but using them in a creative way and like crafting it in a way, really like I've been exploring my own culture. And in that way, I feel like I'm a kid seeing it new, right? And so when I write the kids, it's kind of like me writing also too, like, oh, this is so cool. I just learned about these mo'o, right? Like, oh my god like what if they were real like what would happen you know like what's possible um and so i use that in the storytelling to kind of help it feel 
still relatable to like a kid but also like someone who's like me and older and was not necessarily taught their culture um intimately you know as they were growing up like how would you experience it even as an adult because it also in hawaiian culture a lot of it was all was verbal like a lot of it is communicated in our chants and in our stories um and the stuff that was written down a lot of it is still in hawaiian and because the language you know almost got almost died out like can you imagine like how much knowledge would be lost if we couldn't translate those documents which is still right. an ongoing thing today right so um yeah there's just so many so many things about this uh that i just love and <laughs> um <laughs> ryan just makes this possible for me we we definitely have a great working relationship going through sh- through book two was kind of like learning each other's styles and how each other works and um you know all that stuff but like anything else with communication and like trying to talk it through and at the end like we both really want to create a great series and something that people haven't seen before as long as we can keep our you know our focus on that like it, it we'll figure it out like it's going it's going to be good regardless right like um but we're just having so much fun i feel like like when we get together we start creating we're like kids we're like 100% so 100% <laughs> i think that's, that's important when you go into a, a production or whatever you do you got to have that child like glee going into it. if you have that it's going to be a great uh project that you're working on yeah so i do want to ask this this question is for both of you uh what has been your favorite part of the creation process on working on this book series with each other Hmm. i think well for me like i'm a leader and a mentor at heart i'm an educator all those things so for me like my favorite part is helping people to see ryan's art because this is his like he's tried to publish a children's book before like work for someone who was trying to also self-publish a children's book but it didn't work out And so, like, I get a lot of value, you know, like, one, like, benefiting from his um, fantastical artistic expression, but two, also, like, helping him to see, like, what it's like to be, uh, like, a self, you know, a self-publisher and, like, a lot of the the process that goes in, like, I'm not worried about the art with him. I just want, you know, Mm -hmm. I like helping him see more about what it takes to carry on a campaign, the mindset you gotta have, right? Like, and establishing yourself as an unknown and just kind of working through a lot of those things, those challenges that indie creators face um, and doing it together, right? Like we're a team and just having each other's back, I think is is the, the best part for me. What about you, Ryan? Yeah, I would kind of echo that because like for me, I've not really had a lot of experience in the professional world of art. You know, it's always been something that, you know, it has been my crutch, you know, because you always have in the back of mind, like, you know, is this really good? <laughs> syndrome. You know? <laughs> so, like, I think for me, it's like I, I want to really get out there and get my name out there and establish who I am, you know, because you, you only live for now. You know, mm-hmm. you, you don't you, your time is only here until you're gone you know so i think for me it's like it's time to get past all those crutches and really try to just push yourself and put yourself out there and that's for anybody you know Mm -hmm. but also for me this has been something that is unbelievably new you know i get to texturize and create these characters and with moana we collaborate and make them not to mention these people these, these characters are based off real people so I'm trying to keep, you know, all the essence of these kids as well, you know, because they are such a powerful duel together, <laughs> you know. So I think for me, it's about creating these worlds upon a real place and also creating these characters to live up to who they actually are, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's a huge responsibility, but also the most yeah creative liberation that anybody can possibly have because it's never been done. You know, we do have our, you know, Moana at Disney, but you know, it's a Disney film. You know, it's a Disney film. You know, the structure of what a Disney film is. You know, the art of what Disney is. Mm -hmm. So it's not something new, you know, with Shadows of the Ancient and Journey to Akua, like right now, it's new. You're not going to expect what we're going to build. You know, we're, we're, we have worlds that are established, 
we have temples, we have caves, but these caves are alive. And I think that's what, for me, is different. You know, what I really enjoyed this past year, though, it's based off the of property. I like Arcane, like on Netflix. That was the most beautiful art I've seen in a long time because why? It was new. It was mm. fresh. It was different. It was exciting. You know, you felt their world. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm trying to do in this book. I want people to fill our world, you know, so her IP can grow. The the art can be seen and maybe somebody out there is like, oh, I need to jump on this. What's it going to take, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I'm trying to achieve. And it's just been nothing but fun, you know? And it's been a really exciting point in my career to say that I'm a published illustrator. You know, I could not say that before, you know, I couldn't say that at all. You know, my work is actually published in a, of a children's book and it's out there and it's only getting more. And eventually, you know, I, I can say that, you know, we have a series, mm -hmm. you know, we, there's multiple books to these, these characters, you know, and that's the most exciting thing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, that's very inspiring. Um, Again, I, I do a lot of these interviews and you, you hear horror stories of writers and artists working together and like just nothing coming from it or the story suffers from the art or the art suffers from the story. But it's so refreshing to hear that you two have come together, uh, not even on the whim, but like once as soon as you guys got together, it was like you hit the ground running. And every time y'all get together, you just try to outdo what you did before. Mm -hmm. And that's something like really great that i think we need in the industry in, in the industry with what you guys are creating and how you guys are working together and it's just motivating me to want to get out there and do <laughs> yeah. more things like that um so thank you guys so much um uh as far as your kickstarter how long will your kickstarter be available for people my audience if they wanted to check it out so it ends on november 11th i believe that's a friday um so we have just over three weeks left um and i think we're around 4,300. Our total goal is 14,000. And I know it's like, oh my God, people are like, Juan, are you serious? Yes, that's what we need to make this book. Like this. <laughs> yeah, it's no joke. Yeah, this, 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 it is serial. <laughs> it's serial. It's serious. It's serious. Like, there's no, there's no this, bluff in it. It's for real, for real. <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure you guys are going to hit that uh with no problem and exceed it you already have two successful books out and uh you have your podcast series your youtube channel uh i know for a fact you are on a slate promoting this for the next week or so mm -hmm. uh so i have every bit of confidence that you will hit it and you will hit it with plenty of spare uh, with plenty of money to spare and be able to pay all the everybody that worked on it and get all the books out and everything on time uh i i can't wait i I'm, I'm going to back this project i i say that a lot on my podcast i think i've only backed one or two projects uh i'm definitely <laughs> going to back this one uh just because i believe in it and i cannot wait to show this to my nephews and like i'm going to teach um i'll be teaching a digital uh content creation course coming in january i believe oh, and nice. the kids would love to like see something like this and just see themselves represented in a, a children's book because you don't have a lot of children's books out there that yeah. have representation in it so this is important so thank you guys so much so before we end the podcast i do want to um i'm going to call this a potpourri section i do have some questions that i took down uh, while you guys were talking and I do have some questions from my audience and I want to just kind of pick your brain on some things. So the topics are, again, they call it potpourri because it's just a bit of everything. Um, so I'm going to start with Moana. Um, it's okay. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Um, <laughs> I pick up really huge elemental vibes from you, from your backstory, from just the artwork in the book itself. So just a personal question I would like to ask you. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the series or this uh, particular IP, but you're um, from Hawaii. So I'd like to ask you, if you was in the world of the Avatar, the last airbender, which is a show about oh, the elements, man. what element would you bend? I mean, so I don't know all the names, but I'm definitely a water person. Whatever that gotcha. one is. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I figured it would be that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. 
Ryan, um, this is another personal question for me because um, I dabbled in oil paints and arts and acrylic. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it about painting that that draws you to that particular medium? Painting for me is peace. Um, it gives me peace. Um, I like playing with color. Um, I like infusing colors that no other colors can match. Um, I like taking colors that are not essentially aesthetically put together. Um, so it's for me, it's just about color and creating, you know, a feel. Like I like in my in my paintings and in my work, I like for people to feel uh, what I'm painting um, on every you, page. You. Um, definitely have accomplished that i <laughs> felt something watch looking at this concept art on this kickstarter page um so you have definitely put feeling into it, mm -hmm. your artwork so thank you for that and the, again something you said earlier the textures like how you're blending uh, the colors together and creating a uh, visual textures like you could mm -hmm. like i can almost feel my phone and like oh my god this is amazing and i'm just like <laughs> oh, it's just glass i'm getting tricked it was a <laughs> but your art like like i'm just so blown away by your art i i know i keep saying that and i you know not to say anything i haven't read the story yet but the art already got me blown away so the art oh, the is great goes right, right uh, with the art. <laughs> okay so if the art if the visuals is the that story spectacular is right there this, too yeah. okay okay oh my god this is gonna be an amazing book i cannot <laughs> wait like i i already texted a bunch of people like guess what y'all getting for christmas so <laughs> So this is going to be great. This question is for both of you, and this is an audience question. Uh, what are three, or uh, two or three characters that you grew up with that you personally uh, identify with the most uh, in pop culture? It could just be one character, like your favorite character, somebody who you just, when you saw them, you just instantly identify with that character, or you feel like that character is a representation of you in that. Yeah, I, I got three. I got three. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I'm gonna say Storm, Phoenix, and Ghost Rider. Ooh, or, why Ghost Rider? <laughs> I don't know. I have this thing for motorcycles. My husband and I are in a motorcycle club, but I've always been, um, like you know, the tomboy who does like the non-girl things. Um, I've always rolled in circles of predominantly boys, um, and so that's you know one of the ones that I don't know just stuck out to me. That that's just my my jam. And a lot of people are like, what? Like, yes, yes, that's me. It's okay. I don't have to be the girl. I don't have to be like the one with the with the dolls and all that stuff. That wasn't my thing. I was like rolling in the dirt, getting dirty. You know, that was me. Okay. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Uh, be Daredevil, Ooh. Bucky O'Hare, the Green Rabbit, and a Gelfling from the Dark Crystal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh my god, Dark Crystal reference. You don't get enough of that like ever these days. Oh yeah, you're gonna see that in the art too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one thing that you guys have mentioned a lot in this uh, podcast interview is the importance of indie creators. What is something more that people can do to support other indie creators? Oh my gosh, buy their books. Like... Uh... What I mean, come come on to the Moana Nui podcast. Like we we talk to a lot of different creators. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, indie creators. Like I know people. We we make the things that people say they want. But in order for us to exactly. keep that moving, like we need the resources to come with it, right? So like if you see indie creators at a convention or an event, like go support over and talk them. to them, support them. Support like them. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. What's something more that any creators could do to get their work out to the more general public, to the people who, like you said, a lot of the people say they want stuff and there are people creating it, but where do you get the creator and the people who want that stuff they're creating? How do you better get them to commingle and mash the right person with the right indie creative to get? I, I think for me, it's just being open, mm -hmm. being open to new ideas and to new creatives. You know, I think that's one of the biggest crutches I feel in the indie community. Like, for instance, I'm one of those people who don't like getting DMs from random creators in my <laughs> inboxes talking about their Kickstarter when I don't even know who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, I rather you introduce yourself to me. Tell me what this book is about. Make me feel like I want to back your campaign and know you as a creative. 
And then I can tell you what we're creating as well. And we can collaborate and, you know, support each other's Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what's a lot of missing in the world, you know, just, you know, with indie creators being open and expressive to other creators and being collaborative and learning from each other because it only gets better and bigger and more support in the end. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's one of the biggest things that that I feel like be more aware, <laughs> aware mm. of this kind of like thing, because the, the thing that I love about being an indie creator, it is nothing much, much more than being welcomed. I was welcomed into this world, you know, so and I'm proud to be part of this world now. So it's just something that I feel like that's what we need to continue to do support these creators support their story support what they're doing yeah i think ryan Reese is a good good point there in terms of supporting each other um and one other thing i think indie creators can do too is like to look beyond not just a comic book convention as like your platform like mm -hmm. go to other types of events you know like i you know i like working with kids so like i'll try to find ways to get into schools and you know and things like that um you know, I don't know, like if your comic is about, huh, I mean, I'm kind of blanking on a specific example, but like seek out other um, like local markets and fairs, you know, like it's, it's a, sometimes it can be a little bit, bit of a mixed bag, but you have to do some experimentation too, to see like which types of um, platforms and forums like resonate with um, what you're doing. Um, and so don't just stovepipe yourself into like, a comic book convention because that can be a very busy place right there's a lot of choices there think about like the audience that you're write, writing for and the people that you're trying to reach and try to find um you know an area where you are one if not the only like one of the few and you have less competition around you right in, in that particular space um so it's just all about like you know being creative in other in other ways too, not just in the art that you create, but in the way that you approach your business. All right, fantastic. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, so earlier in the podcast, we brought up the big media companies and how they're trying to appear to be more representative, uh, uh, to produce more representation and be more inclusive. And we brought up the fact that they kind of are coming off a bit gimmicky at times, uh, Disney being the big corporate right now that's uh being accused of that what is it something that the big media companies to do uh could do to make their efforts more genuine because i feel like that sooner or later that's going to be an issue where they're just going to be doing things to that's obvious they're just after black dollars or dollars from other communities uh mm -hmm. what can they do to be more genuine in their efforts and trying to be more inclusive with their ips put people that you know, like the stories that you're trying to tell, put those people onto your creative teams. Like you can't just, putting character on the screen is one aspect of it, but if you want it to be authentic, you have to have the creative team has to reflect the, you know, the stories that you're trying to tell and not just in a, like a puppet way, right? Like you have to really give them, empower them to have the decision-making and shape and influence um, the things that you're creating. I agree. I 100% agree. Okay, great. So this is the end of the podcast. I saved this time for like any final thoughts, anything you guys uh, wanted to say or just get out there that wasn't covered so far? Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I really enjoyed this interview. Um, I think you are like, an amazing host. Yeah. <laughs> you have like the good water flow in your questions. Um, the vibes are strong. Yeah, I, I'm really <laughs> excited to hearing the, the replay on this and sharing it with our backers because I think it will help them to get excited about the campaign too, if they're not already. Um, uh, I, they should be because again, Ryan, the artwork, like, <laughs> I, I don't even understand why y'all are like not fully funded by now. Just, I just saw I'm one with you, picture brother. and I'm like, Thank no, that you. one picture alone was enough for $30,000 of this Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> um, so like, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just floored. And to be honest, like I said, I'm been following uh i've been following you moana for a while now because i'm associated with a lot of people that you know mm -hmm. and i i watch your podcast and i listen to you a lot and i um i follow you a lot everywhere and i'm 
this was kind of a big moment for me uh just Aww. showing like my growth and where i've come from in just the past year alone i never thought when i started this podcast i'll be interviewing illustrators and authors and other podcasters i literally thought it would just be me and my friends for like five years <laughs> talking about geek stuff but this has opened up so many doors so i just want to thank you two for being on um where can my audience find the both of you on the internet and where can they find your kickstarter Okay. Well, obviously on Kickstarter. Yes, <laughs> on Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Moana. The Kickstarter is at Moana the Author dot com. It's a quick, quick link. It'll get you there. Um, the Moana Nui podcast is the podcast we've mentioned. We um, stream on Thursdays at seven and eight thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you want to experience us live, that's that's where you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. On the Agents of Geekdom is the new network that we're now with. Uh, if you want to hear audio, you can find us on Spotify and you know all your your favorite podcast um, outlet. And um, I'm also on Instagram at the Real Life Moana. I'm not super fancy there. Uh, it's it's um, you know your girl is busy, so um, but <laughs> definitely um, engage with me there. Ask questions. Like I, I'm all about the engagement. Um, and so yeah, I thank you all so much for tuning in and giving us a chance to share this platform. No problem. Uh, what about you, Ryan? Where can everybody find you on the in the webs? Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Ryan Robinson. You can also find me on Instagram at r squared two four eight. Um, I am on Five Star Fridays on Agents of Geekdom every Friday at six on uh, Agents of Geekdom, and then um, you can go check out this amazing campaign at the Moana the Author dot com for the adventures of Nicole and Ohia journey to Icoa. Okay, great. And again, thank you both so much for coming on. For everybody else out there on the interwebs that is listening, this has been Mark. Uh, this has been Blurredcast. I always mess up my endings. Uh, this has been Blurredcast. Uh, thank you for listening. I know it's been a minute that I kind of had to take a break after Dragon Con just to get some recuperation done. <laughs> yes. uh, Dragon Con was amazing this year. I'm mad I missed half of it. Uh, you should come. You should I, I'm come. I'm trying. I'm trying to come next year. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can find Blurredcast everywhere where you can find your favorite podcast, Spotify, Anchor, uh, I am on Audible. I am on Apple Podcasts. I am everywhere you can find any podcast that you like. And you can also follow my YouTube channel, Blurredography, uh, and see a lot of my con footage. I did a bunch of cons over the summer, and that's all I've been putting out. And it's just been amazing. I got to meet so many wonderful people over the summer. Uh, Phil Lamar and Stephen Downs at MomoCon. Uh, Karen Ashley uh, and Nakia Burris at uh, Ranger Stop and Pop Atlanta. Uh, um, and a amazing. bunch of more people there, too. And then Dragon Con. Uh, you know, I didn't meet any celebrities, but I felt like a celebrity because I was on first time <laughs> panelist this year and Woo! it was great. So like everything was amazing. So please follow me on my platforms. Moana, I have a question for you. Yeah. I used to end my podcast uh, with the word Mahalo because I used to listen to um, um, Loveline. That's how they ended the, that radio broadcast mm -hmm. back then. And I stopped doing it because I, I realized I didn't really know what it meant. So what does Mahalo mean? And it means thank you. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm going to start this back up and end my podcast with Mahala. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.